All right, let's start. So uh, I'll turn the lights down. OK, so here's the plan for today. Questions? Then I'll check up on your building stage from source. I'll make a few remarks about some changes to how sync works. Um, I'll show you something that might be relevant for some people's projects if you're perhaps running into limitations with interact if you're using the uh, interact decorator or something. And then we'll talk about um, an overview of several of the main components that are in Sage as some examples. It's really just a, I'm just going to choose kind of four or five examples of things that are in Sage rather than showing you everything systematically. Okay, so first general questions. Okay, if you think of any, you can ask me after class. Um, by the way, there's a like a day of talks and stuff related to reproducible research tomorrow. Um, I know because I'm going to be on a panel at about 11 o'clock. So um, I'll try to forward something about this to the mailing list. Okay, second, building Sage from source. So in the terminal, um, this should give me some indication of how many people have built Sage from source. So it looks like a lot of people have. Uh, raise your hand if you've built Sage in your project. Okay, so if you haven't, build Sage in your project. Remember, all you have to do is type git clone blah cd make. It's like uh, three seconds. Which log file should I open to make sure that it's accessible? Um, you should just try running it. And the way you could run Sage is just go to the directory where you built Sage and type dot slash Sage. That runs the command sage in the current working directory. And if it starts up, then you've successfully built sage. If it uh, gives a big key, then you haven't. Uh, but to answer your exact question, there is a log in there called install.log. And if you look at the, say, the end of that file, for example, by typing tail, tail takes a file as input and shows you the last few lines of that file. And you can give options to tail to give like a certain number of lines. Or you could say tail space dash f, and it will watch the file. And as it changes, it'll print out more of the file, which is really handy. But in any case, um, apparently my install.log ends with, the be with that line right there. One of these lines right there. Probably because I started building something and killed it. Um, in particular, if you look at the end of your install.log, it'll probably tell you how long your copy of Sage took to build. OK, so that's that. Um, so sync changes. The uh, architecture of how synchronization of documents worked, or works, I rewrote it somewhat in the last week. So I just wanted to give you a heads up about that. Um, the pin works, I can very briefly summarize what I changed. Good. So here's your project. Here's your web browser. And here's something which I call the hub. Not where you eat food, but um, your browser connects to this. And then you have that. This thing does things like deciding whether or not you're authorized to look at this project, etc. You can't directly connect to the projects. So they're like on virtual machines inside some uh, virtual private network. And until uh, about two days ago, any document that you're editing that was synchronized, including the chat documents, everything, there would be a version of that document here, a version on the hub, and a version in your web browser, and also a version in everybody else's web browsers. And there's also a lot of these different hubs. And I just uh, eliminated this part of the picture, so it just syncs. Um, the connection actually goes through the hub, but um, it doesn't do anything. It doesn't have a copy of the document sitting there. There's only the copy here and the copy here. So it simplifies the flow of changes a lot, and it should um, remove things. For example, um, I think you reported that you were using chat, and it the order was all kind of random. So that should be eliminated as a result. The problem there was that you'd have the version of the document here and here and here, and every once in a while it would sync with this. And really, now that's completely gone. It's you're always you're 
the browsers are always syncing with this master version of the document rather than some intermediate version. And so it streamlines things a lot um, and should be a little bit faster as well, although you barely can tell the difference. Okay, let's see. Next, basically there's some technical change which should make things way better, might, things, might make things a little bit better, but could completely destroy everything. So if everything doesn't work, let me know. Um, because it's a sig very, very, it's kind of where it's an extremely significant change to the code. I mean, basically, I deleted half of the code. But, you know, the way it, when you're using it, it doesn't look any different. It's just that it works rather than it doesn't work. This, this may address your issue also um, when you're using a slow connection. But we'll see. Okay, uh, another thing. So, so I showed you the at interact decorator before, and I'll just remind you of what that looks like. You do at interact, and um, you might have some choices. Let's see. I'm just going to show you a little interact that I don't know takes a number and computes a random number between zero and that number. I think this should work. Trouble getting this thing to run just now. Don't know. Try that over here. Okay, so something funny happening with this worksheet. Maybe it's related to exactly the same thing I just described. I don't know. Weird. Okay, so, well, I'll finish talking about this. So, with Interact, um, it, it's a way to very easily make a little graphical interface. So you have a widget and you have some output, but it's not really very flexible. Um, you don't have to know anything about HTML or JavaScript or anything to use it. You just define a Python function, and what you do is you put add Interact above it, and then it turns each of these. Um, input variables into uh, places where you can type or drag a slider or whatever to get a different value as the input. I'll make this a little bigger. Use that for a moment. Something weird with that. Okay, so, um, and for example, you could give, you know, if you give like something like this, then you get a slider. So there's a whole bunch of these little widgets and just, you don't have to learn any very much to use this um, but I just want to make a couple of remarks in case you're going to do a project that involves using this sort of thing very much. Um, so there are two things. One, if you want to see a list of the different controls that you can use, do interact.tab, and then there's controls. Select that, and then do .tab again. And that shows you the controls. So there's a button, checkbox, color selector, etc. And for each of these, you can select it, and then do question mark. So for example... Uh, range slider, select that, then do question mark, and it will give you examples of how to explicitly create a range slider. So there, and etc. So this gives you a way to see what the controls are. So to figure out what the interact controls are, type interact.controls.tab. Okay? So that's one thing. Um, the second thing that I wanted to point out is that it's possible to, if you know HTML, it's possible to just create output, which uh, you can make, basically you can make standard HTML, JavaScript, CSS, etc. You can make files with those names, load them with the percent load command, and you can write JavaScript code that will call back to your save session, and as that produces output, you know, there's a callback function that gets called, and so you can fill in results anywhere you want. And this makes it possible to use arbitrarily complicated HTML, JavaScript, etc. To, um, to implement something kind of like an interact, but much, much more complicated. I mean, anything you could do with the web page. So I made a little example of this. The code to do this is a little bit hackish still. Um, like this line's pretty ugly, but you can copy and paste it. 
But let me just show you how this works um, in case you want to do something that really goes far beyond what you can easily do with an interact, but which you could do with just standard JavaScript, HTML, and CSS. Okay, so in this directory, which you'll find as part of the Git repo for the course and in the shared project, I've created um, a worksheet, which I was just showing you, and then I've created a JavaScript file, an HTML file, and a CSS file. They're each very simple, and I'll show you each of them. Um, the worksheet loads those three files and runs the JavaScript, and it makes it so that there's a little button we can click, and when we click it, it'll call some code in the corresponding Python process, and as that code runs and produces output, then we'll get back that output, and then we can do things with it. Okay? So first I'll show you the HTML. It's pretty short. So it, um, it makes an A tag, which uh, because I use the button class, you can just assume that Bootstrap is available. It's this, that gives you things like, uh, I don't know, geez, I don't know how much web development you guys know, if any. Raise your hand if when I say Bootstrap, it means anything to you. Okay. All right, that's like half the people. If you don't know any web development at all, this probably isn't going to be that useful for you, unless you pair up with somebody who does. But since about half of you do, I'll just assume you do. Um, so uh, what that does is it creates a thing that looks like a button, like all the buttons, like that save button is just a, an A tag with a um, button class. And then I also added my own class called app button. And then um, input makes a little input field like a little place where you can type stuff, and then the div makes an out, a div where you can put some output. Okay, so that's the HTML, and let me just run this. So when I do percent load app.html, it loads that HTML, and it creates this. So notice there's a button, which was, that's what's created by the A tag, and then there's a little tin in an input box, and then there's some output in a div. And the reason the div looks all crazy with stupid looking shadows and ridiculously big rounded corners and a horrible orange border is because of my CSS. So let me show you the CSS. Um, that's right here. The CSS lets you specify styles for um, the elements in your DOM. So I, the div that I had there, I gave its class, I gave it the class app output. And so all of these properties will get applied to that div. And I of course chose them all to be really ugly just for fun. Um, if you're trying to figure out how to style stuff, by the way, if you're using Chrome, you can hit um, the keyboard shortcut to get the developer tools. Then you can click on the thing that you're trying to style. And over here, it'll show various properties. And you can also just add new ones. So like if I want to you know, change the color of the border from orange to something else, I can just click here and choose a different one and so on. If I want to experiment with different parameters for the box shadow, for the border radius, you can just kind of interactively change them all, see what you get, and then copy and paste the stuff from out of here back into your CSS. So, with, um, and you can also move around in the DOM. So, a web page, there's something called the DOM, the Document Object Model. It's a tree, um, and it's represented in HTML here. And you can click and go highlight the corresponding part of the document up here. So, I'd like to two-minute crash course in HTML. Okay, there's one other very important file here, which is um, app.js. This does the interesting stuff. So uh, here, this uses jQuery to select the button, which is called app button. This is a jQuery selector. And what that means is give me all the things in the document that have the CSS class app button, which there should be only one in this case, and make it so that when you click on that those things, it calls this function. And what this function does when it's called, this is JavaScript, and what it does is it gets the value n out of the um, input box, and then it calls worksheet.execute code. So this is the first part where I'm showing you anything which isn't 100% standard HTML, CSS, JavaScript. Um, so this is the surprising function that you wouldn't know about if I didn't tell you right now because it's very badly documented or not documented. Um, but what it does is it takes as input a dictionary, uh, sorry, it's JavaScript, sorry, map, 
in Python, it would be a dictionary. And it has a couple of different, val uh, I guess, strings as keys. There's code. That's an arbitrary string, a chunk of code that will get executed by the same Python process as the worksheet that we're in. So, um, of course, if that Python process is already running code, this won't do anything until that code finishes. But what it does is, as soon as possible, it'll run this code, and you can access any variables you've defined. You can access anything on the file system. It's like full access to your project. You can do pretty much anything in that code. Um, there's a second variable, data, that lets you pass back any sort of really complicated JavaScript object, and it'll be available as salvis.data, which is a dictionary, at the Python level when that code runs. So if in your um, HTML, like in your document, you have all kinds of interesting data there, like positions of vertices for a graph, I don't know, whatever, stuff that the user typed in, um, you can pass all of that back just by using, this, by using that second line. And in this case, I got the value n as a float out of the DOM and then passed it back as n by doing this. Um, but you can pass back lots of different things this way. Basically, the point is doing this is better than constructing some really complicated string by using uh, string concatenation and stuff like that. Preparse, this will say whether or not it preparses the input. That is, whether it replaces carrots by double asterisks and you know, one third by integer of one over integer of three. If you set that to false, then it will just run this as straight Python rather than preparsing it first. If you set it to true, then it will correctly preparse it first. Maybe I'll set it to true, just because that's probably more likely what you want. And then finally, there's a callback function. This gets called with a sequence of messages. Um, the last one will have message.done equal to true. Um, message.standardout will give the normal output as it appears. So if you do something that involves like a calculation that slowly is outputting data over five minutes or whatever, you'll get a sequence of messages every time the standard out stream is flushed. And so you can get a whole bunch of messages and do stuff as they appear. Not surprisingly, that's how the Sage, how Sage worksheets work. Like when you do for i in range 10, print something, pause a little bit, you know, you start seeing the output. Under the hood, this function is exactly what's used to implement Sage worksheets. So um, it's, it's not just like some one-off thing that you would use. Um, there's a, there are a whole bunch of different things that you can find in a message. And what this does is it will log the messages to the console so you can see what's there. Um, there's like message.standard error, there's a message for typesetting math, there's messages for showing files, there's all kinds of stuff. Um, but for our purposes, which is generated a random number, this should be enough. And so what it does is when it sees any output, it's just going to append it to the output box, to that div that we created. Okay, so now let's go back to the Sage worksheet and try it out. So evaluating this um, reloads it, and now if I click this button, it does it. And then if I change this 10 to, say, 1,000, it's going to use 1,000, it's going to generate a random number between 0 and 1 and multiply it by 1,000 instead. So you get a bigger number. Um, I should probably do something that proves to you that it actually has access to this Python session. Hmm. So how about if we uh, I'll modify it slightly. I'll set the variable a equal to William. And now let's put something in the code that we run so that it prints out, say, uh, print a, and then do that. OK? So now what it should do is print the value of the variable a. At, like, I mean, because you have to keep in mind there's two different places in which code is running when you click that button. And so let's just try it out and I'll sort of tell you what's going on here. When I click this button, what happened was some JavaScript code in app.js ran. And in that code, it said, hey, please evaluate the following chunk of code. And it said that, so basically, the JavaScript code is running right here, but the other code's running in your project, the Python interpreter. And so um, this thing right here got created or got run over. It, it appeared as the output of running something in the project, and then the message got sent back saying, hey, I've got that output, and then it gets displayed in the web browser. Okay? I mean, of course, tons of different web applications work that way. It's a pretty general thing.
And a neat thing is if I change this right now to something else, um, it will of course be reflected. Okay. Um, so with this, you can make arbitrarily complicated web applications that run inside of here um, that may be embedded all kinds of things that get around all the shortcomings of a stage worksheet. And moreover, um, uh, you get to interact with and call anything you can call from Sage, uh, you can Python, and that's really a very large amount of different software. Okay, so that's that. Okay, moving on to my broken worksheet for today. Hey, there it is. Okay, so here's what's in Sage. I think I showed you this very briefly at the uh, very end of class last time. These are the standard packages in Sage. If I wanted to go through and tell you something about all of them, and it took me five minutes each, it would take me a couple, you know, well, there's like 80, so it would take me a couple of weeks, and we'd be done with class. So I'm not going to tell you about all of them. Um, but they all have their own little story, uh, the reason that they're in Sage, and so on. Okay. So I'll just tell you about a couple. Uh, here's some examples. I'll skip that one. I'll start with CVX opt. So this one is a very numerical package. This is a Python library that uh, I think has a lot of C code and other code in it as well. And it's for convex optimization, which does anyone here ever, does anyone here know what convex optimization is? Okay, so who, know, who cares what it is? Let's just read what they say it is on Wikipedia. It looks really useful. It has applications to Control systems, signal processing, communications, circuit design, data analysis, uh, finance. Okay, so now you care, right? So even if you don't know what it is, you care. But I guess here's an incredibly simple example of convex optimization. Minimize a certain function subject to certain constraints. So that's the sort of thing that pops up a lot in, say, finance or other areas. And so, so CVXOPT is a package in Sage use it in Sage, um, but of course you can use it in any Python pack, uh, situation. And here's an example of using it. So um, I there's one caveat if you want to use this in a worksheet or within Sage. Um, in Sage, the floating point numbers that you type in are pre-parsed. So um, let me show you what I mean by that. Pre-parse 2.5. Basically, if you type the string literal I mean the decimal literal 2.5 into Sage, it replaces it by a real number and then the string 2.5. So uh, that's kind of nice in that if you type, for example, I don't know, something like this, then you get all the, I don't know why this worksheet's not working. That should not happen. Hmm. So, okay, I'm just going to brutally make a new worksheet and paste everything in. Okay, so notice that it didn't throw away a lot of the digits. If you did exactly the same thing in Python, it just turns it into a double precision number. So it throws away a lot of information. So in pure Python, without the Sage pre-parsing, it just throws away lots of digits. Every number gets turned into a double precision float, which is um, basically the information is stored in 64 bits on the computer. Whereas with uh, Sage, you have a very good library for arbitrary precision floating point numbers. And mathematicians care a lot about having although computer programmers maybe don't care so much. So they just want everything to be double precision. So there's that difference, but if you use CVX opt, you just try to use even the first example on their website, and you don't um, and you don't do something special, what happens is it turns all of the floating point literals in the example into Sage real numbers and CVXOP annoyingly uh, just rejects them and says 
invalid type. So it knows nothing about sage real numbers. It doesn't convert them to floats, which is very annoying. Um, there's two ways to get around that. One is you put percent Python in, um, and then it works fine because that tells it not to convert them all to sage real numbers. Another thing you can do is just uh, you could just make it so that the real number function actually just makes a float. And then that will work as well. So now, when you type in a decimal, it will just get converted to a float as usual. That's what it, that one line change does. So then, henceforth, then you can use um, CVXopt. Really, somebody should slightly change CVXopt so it converts things to floats if they're you know, some unknown type. And in fact, some Sage developers have done that where various libraries like NumPy, SciPy used to do the same thing where you had to do this annoying hack to get it to fix the real numbers. But um, a UW student fixed it so that NumPy, SciPy would do the conversion automatically. Okay, so that's just one example, but there, this is an incredibly powerful package that if you ever run into problems that involve like a system of inequalities and you want to maximize or minimize something, possibly something very complicated, then you definitely want to look into CVX opt. Um, by the way, it's always bugged me that the way the problem looks is like the thing above, which you can type directly into Sage. We have a way of expressing symbolic inequalities and stuff. Um, I mean, you could just write percent var uh, x1, x2, and then you could say minus x1 plus x2 less than or equal to 1. And, uh, oops, uh, I transpose this. See, I mean, it. Uh, you can, basically you can create, it's kind of a funny hack, but you can create a symbolic inequality. What we do is when you, when it does the comparison, instead of giving true or false, it just returns some symbolic comparison object. And I can see that that's pretty small. Um, it would be pretty cool if somebody were to write a function in Sage so that you could input a collection of symbolic you know, inequalities like that and some function, and then behind the scenes it would call CVXOpt to maximize or minimize or whatever. I just think nobody's got around to doing that. It's what you'd expect would have happened, but it just hasn't happened. If anybody still can't figure out what their project's going to be on, that's a possibility. Make it so that you can input things that get solved using CVXOpt um, in a very natural way, like this, and, uh, and then just call CVX off behind the scenes. Okay, so that's an example of a component of Sage. There are dozens of similar situations. Okay, let me show you another component, Cython. Okay, so um, Cyth what Cython does, so we use this one extensively in implementing Sage, and what it does is it lets you write Python code that's fast. Um, which matters a lot for the purposes of math uh, research type applications. Um, can I make this bigger? So basically, Cython is a language that looks almost the same as Python, but it feels a lot like C. So you get to declare data types, and it what it does is um, it will turn the code from Python into C, compile the C code into a dynamic module, and then link the module in at runtime. Um, you can also create large programs that are standalone um, Python modules in Cython. So here's an example of two functions. They look pretty similar. They do more or less the same thing. One of them is in Python, and one of them is in Cython. I'll just zoom in so they fill the screen. And then I'll talk about each one. So their functions f0 and f1. Um, it's kind of just a silly function. What f0 does is it adds up the, um, I guess, odd numbers in some interval. Obviously, you could come up with a better way of doing this because there's you know, a formula for this. Um, what f1 does is exactly the same thing. The difference between these two functions, though, is that I've explicitly declared the types of the variables in the Cython version. And that will make it significantly faster. So here I said I want n instead of being just any Python object at all, I want it to be a C int. So that'll take, um, I guess, 32 bits of 
it will be stored in some fixed size 32 bits on your computer. So I'll leave MNKB logs, and I'll do the same thing. But instead of it working with arbitrary objects, it only works with ints. And if you try to feed in a value to f1 that isn't an int, it will convert it to an int, if at all possible, or give you an error. So if you think about it, that looks pretty simple. And if you just fed it in an int, the top one in Python would do you know, really the same thing as this. But what if um, you, know, you can make, well, I guess, what I did that range that will convert it to an int. Like, the, the top one's very generic in, in principle. Um, in that it's, it's not really specific to ints, it just turns out to work with ints. Okay, so let's, um, let's try running both of these. And now this is the crazy thing. So let me, I'm going to click on this button, and it's going to show us the corresponding C code, which will be enormous. So here it is. Um, hey, that's not so bad. Ah, okay, so that's not so good. It's missing most of the, I'm confused. Huh? Okay. I think the Cython changed, and hence the thing to show code has sadly the thing to show the auto-generated code has become invalid, which is really annoying. Hmm. Back to you. Okay. Darn. Um, so, yeah, so they must have changed the layout of how Cython does this, which is kind of just annoying. Um, a way to fix that is, let's see. Yeah, um, I can just do what it does. So, um, example dot, I'll just do it in a file, example.pyx. So that creates a Cython file, or actually, I'm having a lot of trouble with anything working. I'm not connected. Okay, that's just weird. In any case, we can, so this gets turned into some C code. Um, I can't seem to show you the corresponding C code right now, but the main point when you look at the C code is it's kind of ugly and you can't really read it, but it's just auto-generated. In any case, let's try out the two functions. So, um, except that these aren't working in this worksheet at all. All right, I'm very annoyed. Um, okay, so now it's working. Uh, so I evaluated the first version in Python, and now here's the corresponding version with Cython. Notice that the <coughs> Cython one is mildly faster. 300 times faster. Um, that happens a lot, actually. So typically, the speed up you get if you're just doing like kind of raw number crunching type stuff in Python, but you could do it directly in C by declaring data types, you can get a factor of 100. This just happens pretty regularly, which is um, something that's very important to be aware of with Sage and Python in general. It's very easy to write Python programs and um, you're doing something that maybe involves making a huge NumPy array and multiplying it by another one or something, that would be perfectly fast. 
But if you're doing some like little number crunching, it just involves some for loops and integers. Um, like you want to implement matrix multiplication yourself from scratch. It can be really, really slow compared to writing the same thing in a compiled language such as C or Java or something else. So you really should be aware of that enormous difference in speed. And this is a good example of it right here. Um, OK. What? No, so not exact. So it doesn't auto, um, it doesn't do type inference, because that's a huge can of worms. That's kind of where they drew the line. Uh, but if you don't explicitly declare a type, then it's just a Python object. So for example, if I do uh, z equals 5, um, then that z is just a normal Python object. So we'll compile and link it. And so it just got compiled and linked. And then when I load it, um, whoops, why didn't that? Oh, I just, I didn't say print it. I just said type it. Sorry. There's also a little time. So the time it's taking right now is because it's running the C compiler on a several thousand line long C program. OK, so notice now it prints out the type. But uh, that's a Python int rather than some like C level data type. <coughs> so if you explicitly declare the types, then it uses them. Um, also, so making something that's sort of simple like I'm showing you right here would be pretty easy. But Cython is enormously sophisticated. It, it's been developed over well over a decade by um, a lot of different people. And it does, you can compile almost everything that's in Python. So you can define classes and do nested functions and I mean all kinds of stuff that C can't even do. Um, you can do it here. Uh, you can also wrap code that's written in C++ libraries. So if you have a C++ library and you want to use some functionality in it, then Cython allows you to declare, you know, here's a class in the library with these methods, etc., and I want to use them. And you'll be able to use them from Cython with absolutely no overhead. It's exactly like if you're using them from a C program. And so that, or a C++ program. So uh, we've used this enormously for building a lot of the basic arithmetic in Sage. Just to give you a tiny example of that, um, if you make a finite field, so um, these are extremely important in, for example, coding theory and cryptography. Here's uh, the finite field of order 9 up to isomorphism with A as a generator. I can make two elements of it. Let's say B is A plus 1 and C is uh, I don't know, A squared, uh, A plus 2. Okay, so these are two elements of that finite field. Look at the time for multiplying two of these together. B times C. Uh, time out. That is a typo. Time in. Nope, that's time it. Sorry. Um, if you do percent time, that's kind of what it does is it runs the thing that you're trying exactly once, but zero seconds isn't very useful. So some things when they're kind of really fast, which comes up a lot when you're maybe doing basic arithmetic. Uh, you can use time it instead. And what that will do is it'll run the computation possibly hundreds and hundreds of times, depending on how long it takes, and uh, compute the average time it took, and then do that again, and then do that again, and then take the best of those. And so it's um, much more useful if you want to time something. So this is 76 nanoseconds. That's really, really fast, in case you're wondering. Um, that there's no way you'd implement finite fields in just straight Python at the interpreter level and get anywhere near that sort of speed. You'd probably be slower by a factor of 100 to 1,000. Um, so the library that's really being used behind the scenes in this case is something called Javaro, which is a um, very crypto-motivated, so cryptography-motivated C++ library for arithmetic and finite fields. And uh, somebody, Martin Albrecht, spent a lot of time making it so that you could use it really easily from Python, but there's no speed <coughs> disadvantage whatever by using it this way. Um, OK, so that's just an example of how Sage is built. We have a ton of C++ and C libraries that people wrote you know, 10 years ago, five years ago, whatever, that implement basic arithmetic. And on top of those, they would run like research level calculations to write papers or crack crypto systems or whatever. So we took a lot of those libraries and then used Cython to make them quickly accessible from within Sage. Right. Um, so there's two more things I want to show you. 
each about five minutes. So here's another uh, component of SAGE called GAP. GAP stands for Groups, Algorithms, and Programming. And it does computational discrete algebra, or abstract algebra, basically, if you're taking a course with that name, or have taken such a thing. So I'll show you their website really quickly. Um, this is another system that's been around quite a long time. I mean, definitely since the 90s. And it's a standalone um, computer algebra system that's free and open source. You can type, you know, gap with the command prompt and run it. Um, see, so I'll show you that. Just type gap. It comes up. So I just changed the terminal size really quickly. I mean, I want you to see the banner, so I'll clear the screen. Clear is the command to clear the screen. Okay, so now gap just came up. And here it is. So this is a way that some people use gap. Uh, it's been around a very long time now. Um, there was a rumor about Wolfram, uh, so Mathematica, trying to buy out GAP at one point a couple of years ago. But the license of GAP is GPL, which you can see right here. And the copyright holders of GAP are all the authors, everybody that's ever contributed code to GAP. And so if you wanted to put GAP inside of Mathematica, and say you're the person running Mathematica, and you get like a couple of GAP developers to agree with that, it doesn't do you any good. Because um, you'd have to get every author of GAP to agree to release another version of GAP under a different license rather than the GPL. The thing with the GPL is if you include a GPL program in a bigger program, then the bigger program has to be GPL licensed as well. Um, and the GPL license says that it has to be open source, and if you distribute the program, then you have to give everybody the source code of the program that you're distributing. Okay, it's you know it's pages and pages of lawyerese, but that's pretty much what it says under the hood. Um, so that didn't end up happening because the copyright's so widely distributed. Though I think there were people that wanted it to happen. I might get in a lot of trouble for saying that in a video. We'll see. Um, okay, so back to our story. I'm going to show you first just a couple of simple things in Sage that use GAP under the hood. They look like they're just Sage code. You don't even know GAP is involved, but behind the scenes, GAP is used. And by the way, for many years, the way that Sage used GAP is it just started up a copy of GAP running, and it textually fed commands into GAP, and then it would watch the output, and then get the output and parse it somehow. And this works reasonably well, but there's a lot of overhead um, at the level of microseconds for every single operation that you do this way. So uh, one week in Barcelona, I think in 2008, I sat down and turned GAP into a C library. So I basically took this thing that was an interactive interpreter and just started hacking the source code and made it so that I could call it as a library, which means that I can link it in directly to other C programs and I can call a function and the command line prompting that it's never involved at all. There's no like parsing stuff with the command line. Um, and then Volker Brown spent probably a month or two fixing my crappy demo and making it something that really, really worked well. And now that's what is used by default um, for GAP in Sage. So the way Sage works, it links in via Cython code GAP as a library, even though that's never what the GAP developers intended. Um, the same is true for a lot of other components of Sage where they had a command line prompt primarily, and we really wanted that much better performance, so we turned them into things that could be used via a library interface say via Cython. Okay, so here's an example of something which if you've ever taken any algebra at all should look familiar. So S4, the symmetric group on four letters, it's the set of all permutations of four things, and if you have two of them, you can compose them and get another one, and it has inverses, so it's a group, and it has order uh, four factorial, and I think you can do list of G just to see all the elements. Okay, they're represented as you know, sort of this cycle notation. And um, there they are. But you can do things with this group. Uh, let's say if I do g.tab, you'll see a list of functions you can call in a group. Like you can do things like um, uh, give me the Cayley table. Uh, uh, I mean, a lot of these things take time to define. But if you've taken a course on abstract algebra, then some of these things might be familiar to you. Some of these things will definitely not be familiar to you as well. So one is normal subgroups. So when you have a group, 
there's a notion of a subgroup that's a subset of the elements that you can also multiply together. And then a normal subgroup is a special type of subgroup. Um, so there's a command normal subgroups. And what that does is it computes explicitly all the normal subgroups of this group. And here they are, given explicitly by their generators. And of course, each of these are also groups. And you can ask for them, their normal subgroups and do things with them, and, uh, et cetera. And also, here's another thing. So the symmetric group is just one example of many um, groups. If you do groups.permutation, you can see the different classes of permutation groups that are supported in Sage. And these are, not surprisingly, the same ones that are supported in Gap. Really, this is a wrapper around functionality that's in Gap, with lots of extra functionality added on top. Um, and Gap doesn't have maybe you know, Cayley graphs or whatever, because they don't even do much with graphs. But we add that on top and make it easy to plot things. So there's all kinds of you know, complicated groups here, bihedral groups, etc. And you can explicitly do computations with them. There's the Rubik's Cube group, for example, you might find amusing. A group of all ways of twisting a Rubik's Cube, which is some enormous group. And solving Rubik's Cube is like uh, doing something with an element, writing it in terms of generators. Okay, so that's something in GAP. Also, you can directly use GAP in a Sage worksheet by just doing percent GAP <coughs> at the beginning of the line. Right? Now, the last thing, which I hope won't put you to sleep, is Pillow, which is a, an image processing library. So there was a library for Python called PIL, which very recently was forked because nobody made a new release of it for like six years or something. Um, so it was kind of dead. But it's a library. You can just use it from Sage. It's called PIL. You say from it, fill import image. And it, it does things like you can convert images from one format to another. You can um, uh, do all kinds of transformations of images, etc. It's kind of like a pro Python programmatic version of Photoshop or something, except with obviously less functionality than Photoshop. But it has you know a bunch of filters and stuff like that. Um, so I'll just show you a little demo. So if I do from pill import image, and then open an image of a picture I took over the weekend, which is called Santi, then um, so all I did was say said image dot open. And then here I do image.save it to a file. Salvis.files, how you can embed a file, like an image or something in the output of a worksheet. And so there's a picture of uh, a mighty morphing Power Ranger. And now if we go down, you can see some examples. These are from the tutorial for Pillow. So this one, there's a function thumbnail, which takes as input your image and turns it into a thumbnail. And then I save it. Then here's another neat example. So here, what you do is you take your image and you crop out some piece of it, and you get a region, and then you can flip it over, and then you can paste it back in, in, the site, in this case, in the same spot. Okay. So you can see how this is a programmatic way of doing the sort of stuff you might do in GIMP or Photoshop or something like that. And you can already start imagining writing little you know, Python programs where you have fun with this. Or you can take your picture, break it up into a whole bunch of little pieces, and randomly put them back. It would be, be a few lines of code to write something that makes a mosaic out of the picture. And you can just see it right here in the worksheet. Okay, um, here's an example where instead of flipping it over, the only change I made was I used the rotate method on the region. And what that does is it just rotates some number of degrees, and then I pasted it back in the same spot. And then there's also um, filters. So here's the contour filter. So I took the previous image with the rotation pasted back in, and then I just called um, in.filter on it. And it gave me, and I, uh, there's a whole bunch of filters in image filter. And I chose the contour one. And there's probably parameters for them I didn't use this that much. Um, so I uh, applied that filter. And let's see. So hopefully be, oops. Oh, yeah, I have to redefine M, because I guess. OK, I just defined M. Name image is not defined, sorry. Because I, I put all this in a new worksheet. I have to rerun various things. Let's see, 
So let's do this one. Okay, and then make this interact. And now I just had it pick out all the filters, and so you can click a button and it does that filter. Um, so if I'm doing boss, there we are. Find edges. Um, whatever. Okay, so um, I don't know where Pill is going to go development wise, but it's just another example of an interesting Python library. Okay, all right, so see everybody Friday. Thank <laughs> you.